shedding a tear was a crime, I would have a life sentence in jail. Uh, this past week in, in uh, sending my, my oldest girl off to Tallahassee. Um, thank you for all your prayers. Um, God is good to us, and uh, we have to go through things that stretch us and um, change us, and so it does feel a little surreal, uh, honestly. Um, but you know, last week we talked about uh, just by definition, the gospel's got to go outward. Um, and at the very same time, the gospel, by definition, goes inward. And it's got to change us. And, it, and, and it, the Lord is committed to he who began a good work, God who began a good work in me, he'll complete it. Um, and that means the gospel's got to go out, and the gospel's got to go in, and the gospel's got to go out, or got to go up. And so as we think about that, um, I want to start out this morning with just a few quick snapshots of Jesus that I think might surprise us a little bit. When you think about um, what God, what Jesus incarnate, God incarnate, wants from us. Right? So we're going to start with John 1. And um, this is Jesus calling his disciples. It says this, The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. This is the time when he's calling his 12 disciples. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethesda. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And then here's Nathanael, right? Nazareth? <laughs> Can anything good come from Nazareth? You know, Tampa. Can anything good from good come from Tampa? I mean, what's the deal here? Come and see, said Philip. Now, Jesus knows everything. He hears you. He sees. He knows every one of your secrets. He knows every one of your quotes. And you are just, uh, you know, Nathaniel is just hammering them, right? Giving them the business. Nazareth, can anything come there? When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in, him, in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. I think Jesus would be a little bit um, offended by that. Nazareth, what do you mean? Yeah, are you calling out my town? Are you saying there's something wrong with my city? But that's not what Jesus saw. Here's what Jesus saw. He saw a guy without a mask. He saw a guy named Nathaniel who just said it. And though it was a little harsh and it had an edge to him, notice that Jesus, his response was pretty warm when he just kind of gave him a dig from his hometown. Let's jump to Matthew 20. Then the mother of Zebedee, of Zebedee's sons, came to Jesus with her sons. This is James and John, of course, the sons of Zebedee. And kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, and this is pretty bold, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Here's all I want, Jesus. Take my two boys, put them to the right and to the left, right? Your two, your, make them your two right-hand men, uh, right men. Men, I can't speak this morning. Jesus, you don't know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. I think that's a bold ask. I think Nathaniel's, uh, Nathaniel's comment and these, uh, this mom's uh, ask are bold. But notice, in both of these, in both of these passages, what is, uh, what is um, omitted? What, what did both of, of these interactions, um, what is absent pretense? You know, Jesus hates masks. And we bring him into this room right now. I think you've got a few on. I think I've got a few on. And as harsh as it seemed, and, and though this, you know, these, these, these you know, uh, 
Nathaniel needs to be refined. So does the, the mom of James and John. They, she needs to be refined and sanctified. There's something about honesty and bold honesty with Jesus and not bringing a mask to him and just letting it ride that he responds to. Do you do that with him? The work of the gospel inside of you is it great enough to where you're done with pretense with Jesus? So if you're by yourself in your bedroom, does the gospel move in such a way that you just, hey, the good and the bad, because here's what we know. You are made imago Dei in the image of God. And Jeremiah 17, your heart is deceitful above all things, for it there is no cure. You are um, beautifully a sinner and beautifully a saint. And here's Jesus. Next interaction. Luke 7. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life, a woman of ill repute, if you will, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And then, as we know, in the, particularly in the first century, the ancient Near East, a woman's hair was her glory. A woman's hair was her vulnerability. So she takes her hair, and what does she do? She wipes the feet of Jesus. She wiped them with her hair, kissed them, kissed somebody's feet who wore sandals and walked everywhere. That's what she did, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said, to him, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner, that she works at an establishment that there's no way she should be here. And then think about this. You're a disciple, and Jesus sits at the table with you. And here he is, and he has just had this woman, this stripper, if you will, wipe his feet with her hair. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. All right, tell me, teacher. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more. Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Jesus says, you have judged correctly. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing me. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Jesus has a hard time with appropriateness sometimes. Wait, Simon, I came to your house, and here comes this stripper, and she just falls and becomes a mess in front of me. You, you do the appropriate thing. Oh, no, 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 you stay seated, you're appropriate, you kind of judge the situation, and then you respond. Jesus says, what? do you not understand what the gospel has done for you? Why would you not, what, be seen as a fool in front of, you know, whoever was eating dinner with me? Why would you not do that, Simon? There's something about you, there's something about the inside of you, maybe that the gospel hasn't reached. Is that you? Is that me? When we decide, you know what we need to do? We need to be nice or appropriate or this isn't the place, and that becomes our default. And that's what Jesus is calling out. Are you willing to just look like an imbecile for me, like this woman looked, needy, vulnerable. And there's some people in this room that would never, ever, ever do that. You would never show need. And what Jesus is saying, are you kidding me? 
I came to save you. And you won't show need. In fact, the social pressure of a room here in this sanctuary is such so great that if you needed to just fall to your knees and just weep, you wouldn't do it because you're so scared of what everybody in this room thinks. You cannot be like that, Christian. Because then the gospel, you know what? Maybe it hasn't moved in you enough. Maybe it's moved out. But let me tell you, the social dynamic, the social temperature of a room won't undo you like it did this woman and she is the example she is the model and you would think the disciple would be the model or the host no she is the example and jesus is saying could you all do that could you all get down on your knees smell my stinky feet wash it with a you know whatever that cost her which was a lot has the gospel moved inside of you because if the gospel just moves out right then we're a church that's a mile wide and an inch deep. But if the gospel moves in, you know what happens? Is that we begin to to understand how sinful we are. Jesus hates pretense. And in a lot of situations, he hates, he cannot stand the nice Christian. Are you okay with that? We live in suburbia. We think a lot about that. It becomes our default. Maybe... At some level, just living in a society that we live, it just has smoothed over the edge that we need to, to, to have. I mean, would you do that? Because the gospel has literally changed your life. Last snapshot. Matthew 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. Maybe you've done this to Jesus. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? What do they do here? They set them up. What's the fastest way to a man's heart, they think? His ego. I'm just going to give him some, you know, some flattery. That'll do it. And we do that to Jesus. Jesus, you are the Son of God. You are God incarnate. You can do all things. You died on the cross. Now, do this for me. Or, how do I do this? But Jesus, he could see right through it, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin you use for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. Notice the tone in Jesus in those last two little snippets, and the first two. The first two were what? Softer by Jesus. Go to the next slide. Those four interactions... No mask, no mask. What do we have? A mask of social uh, appropriateness. Flattery as a mask. Notice the tone that Jesus uses. Has what? Has the gospel moved into your heart um, and, and moved inside of you such that you could be this woman? That you could say to Jesus, Seriously? A baby in Bethlehem? You know, I know Rome didn't last, but I don't see you as king, Jesus. Some of us need to be able to sing that psalm. Some of us need to be able to say, you know what? I, um, I don't understand what you are doing. Because here's what's happened. I believe in our society, culture, over time, Americana has given us these cultural commandments. Cultural Ten Commandments, if you will. And... I want you to think about it like this. Think about money as the first commandment from our culture. That money, in our society, money is the best way to what? It's the best way to source your security. That the more money you have, the more important you are. And if you make lots of money, you prove you've made it. First commandment of our culture. Second commandment, conflict. Avoid conflict at all costs. 
don't get people mad at you. Be nice. And so when we think about conflict, and I'm not saying to, to, you know, to just go be a bully, but when we see this and we avoid it and, and, we, and we decide, you know what, I will literally sacrifice the name of Jesus to avoid a social conflict, what are we doing? And he knows this, and these interactions in the gospel are there for us to what? To, to learn from. Sex. Sex is, is not to be spoken about openly. Men can be promiscuous. Women must be chaste. Sexuality and marriage will come easily. Yeah, right. Grief and loss. Sadness is a sign of weakness. You are not allowed to be depressed. Get over your losses and you quickly move on. Expressing anger. Being honest. Anger is dangerous and bad. Explode, explode in anger only to make a point. Sarcasm is an acceptable way to release your anger. You don't want to deal with it, so I'm going to be sarcastic. It's a very passive side door way of letting out your anger. Sarcasm, that's what I will use. And culture says do it that way. Family, you owe your parents for all they've done. Don't speak of your family's dirty laundry ever in public, right? You have a duty to family, and, and, and culture comes before everything. And we have these rules, and they're in us. And we live by them. And Jesus says, I've got to come first. I have to come first. In relationships, our culture says don't trust people because they will let you down. Because nobody should ever hurt you again. So you know what? Don't be vulnerable. And you look at this woman and you look at the, the example, the, the, the wrong example of Simon and you think, oh my goodness. Attitudes towards different cultures. Only be close friends with people who are like you. Don't marry a person of another race or culture. Certain cultures or races are not as good as what? As mine. And these things are embedded into what our psyche. And we can't even, we can't even know ourself. And that's the problem because the gospel goes out. Sure does, but the gospel goes in. And all of these commandments, right? Uh, they come into conflict success here's what success is getting into the best schools well that may be right because Florida State and no, I'm kidding <laughs> success is this you get into a good school success is making lots of money success is getting married and having lots of children that's that's really success and 10 feeling you're feeling an emotion you are not allowed to have certain feelings. Your feelings are not important. Reacting with only your feelings, uh, reacting with your feelings without thinking is, is com completely okay. And, you know, we have these commandments that rule. And you know what happens? As Christians, here's what we do. We learn a few verses and we share our faith. And you know what? We become emotionally and spiritually stunted. And the gospel has what? The gospel's got to go and break through those barriers. Because I believe, I mean, just reading through these and, and thinking through these, man, the gospel has had to confront each one of these. You know, when God has blessed you with a family that you grew up with, with money, and you grew up in, in, in the house of a physician, you know what? It feels secure. And I always felt secure. And so then, to not do what my dad did and feel less than, I feel like I have not had as much impact as my father because you know what? Just look at the spreadsheet, man. I do not make as much money. I have not, I mean, and he set me up. So, so am I a disappointment? Is that really true? Why do I have to process all of that and get that through? Because you know what? I've got a commandment that says money gives you security and, and the more money you make, you know what? people will show more esteem to you and i want that huh. is the gospel bigger than that is, is it greater than that please tell me it is say that we will work through so here's what some of us do some of us we take these strategies and we try to use them uh, to to justify ourselves but you know what they are they're symptoms 
There's symptoms of a sickness that we have. And I just want to, I'm going to run through a few of these that we see all throughout Scripture, but uh, many of us use them. First is this. You use God um, to run from God. Think about that. How many of you have you used God to actually run um, from God? Um, when you do God's work to satisfy you and not Him, I will help out, but I want to satisfy me and make me feel good about what I've done instead of Him. Um, when I use His truth to what? To judge and to devalue others. When I exaggerate my accomplishments for God to subtly what? Compete with others. Well, this is what I've done. When I use Scripture and, and, and specific parts of Scripture to what? To justify the sinful parts of my family or my culture or my nation instead of what? Evaluating them under the full lordship of Jesus. When I hide behind God talk deflecting any spotlight on my inner cracks or when someone brings them up, I become defensive. See, we can use God, particularly those of us that have been in the church for a long time, we can use God to run from God. You can use spiritual speak, spiritual lingo to actually run from God. When I do things in the name of Jesus that you know what I know in my heart, he never asked me to do. But I like to tell people he did it or I'm doing those in the name of Jesus. And I know, no, he's never asked you, Frank, to really do that. When my prayers are really about God doing my will and not what? Not surrendering to his. Have you been there? Maybe you're there right now. Maybe this is a symptom. You know what? I, I've got to look at this. I've got to see what God has for me. Maybe, you know what? You've ignored some of the feelings that God has given you, like anger or sadness and fear, and you run from those things. And you know what God wants to do? Um, he wants to work through those. He wants to say, you know what? Um, I know it says in Philippians to don't be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition. But you know what? I want to work through that. And when you ignore it or pretend like it's not there, and everybody can feel it, and every interaction that you have, people are like, whoa, she's angry, or she feels nervous all the time, or they're, they're not even speaking to the sadness. They just lost a loved one, and they won't even talk about it. Everyone feels that around you. The Lord knows what's going on, but you know what? If I can minimize it or deny what's going on, um, then I feel like I am in control. But it's a distortion. And, and, and I think in our, in our world, when we overthink and pretend like every emotion is evil, it's not. We are emotional. Of course, emotions can be wrong, but they are not Wrong, emotions are not sinful in and of themselves when you ignore those things when you don't deal with them and you just say you know what I need to do I need to read the Bible more well you're sad and you say you just need to read the Bible more no, no you got to work through the grief in your life you are so scared about not being able to have a kid and that is ruling your life you think just reading through the book of First Peter, if you will, is going to make you better? No. You know what God is asking you what? Is, is asking you to work through. And then, many of us, we want to deny um, the past and the impact of the past. Many of us want to say things like this. Here's what the Bible says. The old is gone, the new has come. Right? You are new in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And we say, okay. And then we forget. Look at the, look at the marriage of Jacob and Rebekah. What was Jacob known as? He was the deceiver. He didn't really learn to tell the truth. Right? Look at the favoritism that he passed on to what that he passed on to joseph i mean how how that thing played itself out i mean the, the you just look at the patriarchs and isaac and jacob and joseph and the dysfunction of all those marriages all those brother jacob and esau relationship they never reconciled 
They didn't, they didn't talk about the, the impact of the past. And we don't want to do this, I know, because you think, well, I don't want to, I don't want to just make, I don't want to play the victim card. I get that. And you can play that card, but so many of us, um, we were never taught to um, be honest about, you know what, I was abused. I was 12 years old, and I was abused. And you know what? Sex is not something positive for me because it was completely warped. Now, here's what I think. Because the gospel, because of Jesus, I should be an overcomer, and I shouldn't have to deal with that. But here's what we know. like The heart is the heart. And um, it hasn't been guarded. It hasn't been um, boundaried. And when it's been traumatized, you have to work through that. And so many of us just deny what the, the, the impact of our past on the present. And it's all throughout the scripture. And I will say this, the good and the bad. Right? The blessings um, of, of our family, sometimes we don't want to acknowledge and say, yeah, no, that's from my dad. That's from a grandpa. That's from a grandmother. Because we want to think, no, we did it. No, no, that, that's a blessing just from... But at the same time, the consequences of their sin come into our lives. And we do not want to deal with that. And as a church at large, I don't think we, we, we speak about this um, freely enough in our groups to where we're, we're really honest. Next thing, how many of us have decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to divide my life into secular and sacred right this is my secular life this is my sacred so when I, on sundays right i'm going to sing about god's love but then when that guy cuts me off i want to pronounce the death penalty on him right <laughs> right i mean it's sunday so it's a sacred day and but but i tell you what if he cuts me off tomorrow or he does whatever it's not sunday it's not a sacred day it's secular world so so this is really a, a division and so many of us can justify those things, um, and, and we can, you know, cry during songs of, of love and grace of God, but you know what? We can regularly complain and blame others for the trials in our lives. Because, you know, if you look at it, the statistics are devastating that church members divorce their spouses as often as secular neighbors. Church members beat their wives as often as their neighbors church members giving patterns indicate that we are almost I mean it's, it's barely a, a blip higher than the materialistic secular world what is the difference we've been able to separate this right of higher committed evangelicals 26% think premarital sex is completely okay and, uh, and you know those that, that classify themselves as lower committed evangelicals 46% believe that is completely okay so we can do this very simply sacred versus secular are you doing that is that the way you see the gospel and then many of us and this is kind of running from god it's kind of similar but i think some of us believe that um i'm going to do for god and we do a lot for god but this is what one of my professors said. He goes, you know what, Frank? You do a lot for God as a youth pastor. This was in Orlando. But I wonder, my, my spidey senses wonder, are you in God? Yeah, you do things for him. But are you really in God? Do you do holy things? Do you work at Kids Town? Do you come to church? Do you play in the, in the worship band? But are you actually in the Lord? And so... These obstacles get in the way. Last thing I want to say is uh, some of us have become um, good at judging others' uh, spiritual journey, right? I love what the Desert Father, Thomas Merton, wrote this. He said this, The monk must die to his neighbor and never judge him at all in any way whatever. If you are occupied with your own faults, you have no time to see those of your neighbor. But many of us, we say, ah, you know what? Men are idiots. They're socially infantile, which probably we are. Women, they're just like this. They're overly emotional. The rich, they're just self-indulgent. The poor, they're just lazy. Those, those artists and musicians, they're so flaky, right? Those engineers, they're just so cerebral. 
right? The, the Presbyterians are way too structured, or, or the Pentecostals, they don't have any structure, or the Episcopalians, they light all their candles and all their written prayers, right? Those Roman Catholics, for, for the way in which we, they, they view the Lord's Supper, or for the Orthodox Christians, you know, the, all their iconography, iconography, and we judge people. Where are you? When you stop doing these things, here's what I think we can do. I think we go back uh, to what I think scripturally are the basics for spiritual formation. For growing our faith, and I love this. This is, this is King David, right? This is King David, and this is Psalm 55. He's the director of music with stringed instruments. This is David, and he's writing this song. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me and I am distraught. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen on me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. As for me, I call to God and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress and he hears my voice. He rescues me unharmed from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. Do we write songs like this? Do you have a, a devotional time with God where you can let it rip? Because this is beautiful. This, that, that he would say, you know what? I am in anguish, and it feels like a death, but you know what? Um, I'm going to call to the Lord, and here's what I know, that the Lord saves me. He doesn't deny all of the stuff that he has done. Just like he didn't deny, uh, you know, committing adultery with Bathsheba. He didn't deny all that he had done. It was right there. But he knew what? He knew that the Lord was quick to forgive. As for me, I call to God and the Lord saves me. On a bad day, he goes to the Lord. On a good day, he goes to the Lord. When he doesn't take a shower, he doesn't say the right words, he still goes to the Lord. And when he does have a good day, and, and when he does look like he wants to look, he goes to the Lord. It's that type of grittiness that I, I wonder if the suburban church, um, if, if we have that. If, if we're willing to say, who cares? A house, no house, a jacket, a tie, uh, a nice car, a home, whatever. The only thing that matters is that, that we were aliens from God. We were enemies from God. But now, what? He has brought us back to himself. And this is Colossians 1, and uh, through 23. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the what from the hope held out in the gospel so what does it mean for us to do this i think it's two it's it's these two it's these two um highways of constantly recognizing the impact that sin our own sin the sin of the world is having on us and our need for a savior and constantly saying you know what who has come to us the Holy One has come to us, Christ and, and His perfection, and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit's perfection. If we can go down those two ad, uh, avenues and say, you know what? I, I will never arrive. And you know what? God continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And if we do that, you know what happens? As we, as we explore those two avenues, the cross will continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. As you see how sinful you are, and you will not deny you know, these commandments of culture or the impact of, of, of sin that's, that you know, your family line or whatever has happened in your life has on your own life. Once you don't deny that, and you continue to give that to Him, there's a freedom. Because going back to the very, very beginning, you know what He loves? Honesty. Jesus could not stand pretense. Even if it was hard on him, he was so warm to, to it. And, I, and I'm wondering, do we do that enough here? Because I do think we take opportunities to share and to invite. And I, I think we do that pretty well. 
but I would love to hear more stories of breakthrough. Uh, and that starts with me, of being honest about the inner life that God wants, how, how the gospel needs to, to impact us and, and our inner life. Are you willing to do that? Because it means, yeah, there is some self-reflection. Our, our, our father of Presbyterianism, John Calvin, says, here's the thing. You can't know God unless you know yourself. And some of you are scared to know yourself. You're scared, you're scared to travel back to some hard memories and be honest and say, you know what, this has actually affected me. This affects my marriage every single day. My wife's father affects her every single day, and I'm so scared to talk to her about it. My grandfather, my, you, know, you, you fill in the blank. And when we understand the impact of the past or the impact of our sin or the impact of these commandments that we tell ourselves, you know what, we are locked up. But remember, Galatians, it's for freedom that Christ has come. He wants you to live life and live it abundantly. Fellas, are you Iron John? Do you live life on an island? Maybe you need some boys in your life, some brothers or fathers in the faith. You never had one. You never had a dad who actually asked you how you're doing spiritually. And by that, I mean also emotionally. So you don't know what the heck you're doing. You're so scared to talk about it. I was so scared. It wasn't until I went through a two-year program and I was in counseling every single week. And I would just stutter and stammer until I got comfortable with it but man i had to learn what it meant to do that but you know i tell you what once i was able to identify it and i was able to speak to it uh, the gospel came in in a whole new way and fellas we're called to be the leaders of our homes we are called to be the emotional and spiritual initiators and so many of us aren't because you know what i, I recognize you haven't had an example for for a lot of us of actually how to do that but you know what we're still called to do it and to fumble, and, and, to, uh, and, and to, you know, it, it not look smooth and pretty. But as we do that, you know what happens? Your 12-year-old boy catches you repenting of a sin that you would have never said in front of your father growing up. And that freed him up. Your daughter heard you say, you messed up and you need Jesus, and it changed her life. That's been no more evident in my life as, as I've, I've thought about Elle over the past week two weeks like oh my goodness please god did i put up a pretense of being a pastor or a pastor's family what's that going to do for her at florida state nothing nothing it's only when she recognizes that you know are we a family that says we are sinners and we mess up and we need a big jesus that's the old, that's the thing that's going to save her in tallahassee and i i've just been so it's been so heavy on my heart this week and i want it for us because man time goes i mean like that she was walking into preschool and now she's gone and i'm thinking holy mackerel we don't have every time in the world it matters now it's weighty what we do and so as you think about the gospel going in are you willing to take risks for him and look stupid. But you know what? When you look stupid like the woman did, you know what? You receive freedom and a grace that you never thought possible. And Simon's still locked up. Simon's still functioning by these rules and Jesus called him out and said, you don't need to live like that, buddy. She is your mentor. You are not mentoring her. And she is the, quote, sinful one. So let's ask God to be